Hey guys, Michael Hyatt here. Let me just put my microphone on. Just realized I don't have that on. Oh my gosh, it's all tangled up. This is me, real and unfiltered. How you guys doing today? Let me plug this in and see if you can tell a difference. All righty, put it on my chest here. Plug it in. Okay. Tell a difference? Hey from Indiana. Hey from Alaska. My brother lives in Alaska. Been there a few times. Alabama, Copenhagen. Phil from Nashville. Hey, Phil. Um, somebody from Minnesota. Chicago, Miami. Scotland. Yes, love Scotland. Mexico, Florida. Nashville, Brazil, Puerto Rico, Northern Ireland. I've been to Ireland too, and I love that as well. I just adjust this just a bit. All right, guys. Well, it's Wednesday. By the way, do you know what today is? Today, in the United States, in 1920, women finally got to vote. It was long overdue, but congratulations to all you women out there. Um, what in the world did, did we do before you were involved in the vote? I mean, that was just boneheaded. I don't know what that was about, but I'm glad you got the uh, vote. So anyway, congratulations. Uh, my name is Michael Hyatt. This is the Virtual Mentor Program, and this is where I provide you with the clarity, the confidence, and the tools you need to win at work and to succeed at life. And today, I'm going to be talking about a very important topic, how you might be just sabotaging your own future and not even know it. Ugh, sounds scary, doesn't it? If you're watching the replay of this, you can still give me some hearts. All you got to do is tap a couple times on the screen to give hearts. It's like virtual applause. And I'd be grateful. If you don't know me, just for the sake of those who, of you who are tuning, tuning in for the first time, I'm Michael Hyatt. Um, I'm the author of the New York Times bestseller platform, Get Noticed in a Noisy World. Uh, I'm also blog over at michaelhyatt.com where I get about a thousand page, thousand, a million page views a month. And my podcast, which today, by the way, is number one in the self-help category. And I'm gonna be talking about that podcast today. But my podcast is called This Is Your Life. If you go to iTunes, you can search for my name there and tune in. And I would really encourage you to do it for today's episode personally. And I've never said this publicly. I think it's the best podcast episode I've ever done. And I'm hesitant to say that because I don't wanna to toot my own horn but I think it's a very important topic. It's not that what I have to say is so eloquent, but it's just a, a hugely important topic and we're gonna be talking about it uh, today. If you did get a chance to listen to it today, can I hear from you? Can you tell me yes in the comments? Hey, Sarah Brown. How's Michelle keeping uh, up? Really miss her contributions. Me too. The good news is she's gonna be back for season six. So we're gonna record this next month. I can't, can't wait. Okay, some people say not yet. Some people say yes, they did listen to it. Nope, but I'm going to check it out. Great. And you can find that episode, by the way, at The Mentor, like virtual mentor, thementor.tv slash pessimism. Okay? So again, I want to talk about what you might be doing to sabotage your own future and you might not even be aware of it. Can you guess what it is? If you think you know what it is, there's a clue... On this screen, do you think you know what it is? Let me know in the chat box. What is it that could sabotage your future? Somebody said the new backdrop is so much better. Thanks, appreciate the thumbs up. Give me some hearts if you like the background. Pessimist, yes, self-doubt, that's true. Pessimism, 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 pessimism. That's exactly right. Now here's the funny thing about it. I was just talking to my wife, Gail's assistant, Mandy. And um, she admitted to me that on the strength finders, somebody said I could try to spell pessimism, but I'd probably get it wrong. <laughs> so Mandy admitted to me that in the strength finders test, by the way, if you go do the test that comes out of the book, like strength finders 2.0, you get your five top strengths. And I don't know, I can't remember what the cost of it is, maybe 10 bucks or so. If you pay a little bit more, you can get all 34 strengths. And I highly recommend you do this because not only are your five strengths interest, interesting, but your five bottom strengths or your five greatest weaknesses are interesting. 
And so Mandy confessed to me that number 34 is positivity. I actually think that's great because I don't want people in my organization or around me that are exactly like I am. You know, I, I heard somebody say one time, and you've probably heard it too, that if the people around you think exactly like you do, then somebody is unnecessary. You know, you need people that think differently. You need people that are the opposite of you. But just because positivity isn't your number one strength doesn't make you a pessimist. But she did say something funny to me. She said, I never think of myself as a pessimist. I just think of myself as a realist. And I think that's the danger in pessimism. And she actually isn't pessimistic. I've never uh, picked up uh, any of that from her. But I do think that sometimes people who are pessimistic think of themselves as realists. You know, they think, well, gosh, you know, somebody's got to be the grown up here. Somebody's got to be realistic. Somebody's got to throttle back these optimists because if we don't, you know, they'll act irresponsibly. They'll just take off and they'll ignore the problems. They won't address the obstacles and our organization will be the worst for it. So let me just tell you a few of the things that I cover in this particular episode. And I'm going to take questions here in just a minute. But in this episode, and I'm not going to give you the blow by blow on the episode because I want you to listen to it. If you've never listened to my podcast below uh, before, this absolutely is the best way to start. Again, you can find it in iTunes or you can go right to this link, vmentor.tv slash pessimism. And you can find uh, both the video, because it's a video podcast, and the audio. But this would be a great one to tune into. I think the message is so important. Not only do you need to listen to it, but there's probably somebody in your family or somebody on your team that needs to listen to it as well. Okay, so here's some of the things I cover. Let me just grab my notes here. One, how pessimism robs you of professional opportunities and advancement. If you believe that, give me some hearts. Pessimism can rob you of professional opportunities and advancement. I also explain how pessimism undermines creativity, but not just your creativity, the creativity of the people around you. Pessimism is a creativity killer, okay? Yes, somebody said, Michael, is the podcast free? Absolutely, totally, 100% free. I've got a couple of hundred episodes there. I'm just talking about the most current one that I published this morning. Okay, what else you'll discover in this podcast? Why it's so stinking easy to go negative. It happens uh, in a lot of organizations. It's a very common way to connect, but I talk about why it's so easy to go negative and what you can do to keep yourself from getting negative. Okay, another thing you'll discover. Okay, this is, this is a big one. The risks that pessimism poses to your health. Yep, that's right. The science is in. Pessimism is not just a preference. It's a mindset that has massive, massive impact on your health. Okay, that's in the podcast. Another thing you'll discover, four simple ways to stop pessimism dead in its tracks and get rid of it today so you can stop sabotaging your future. Okay, so it's a very, very practical episode and I really want you to hear it again at vmentor.tv forward slash pessimism. Okay, again, I'm Michael Hyatt. I'm the author of the New York Times bestseller platform, Get Noticed in a Noisy World. And I'm really here to give you the clarity, the confidence, and the tools you need to win at work and to succeed at life. So let's talk about pessimism. If you think, if you suspect you might be a pessimist, would you be willing to admit it in the comments? Let me hear from you. By the way, yes, how do you share this? Thank you, Requisa, for asking that question. Slide left to right on an iOS device and bottom to top if you're on an Android device and click the share button. Please, please do that. And give me some hearts. Somebody said, I am pessimistic. Me, a realist. <laughs> oh my God, definitely. A reform pessimist. That's what I like to hear. Tina Hutchison says, me too. Somebody says, I was. Somebody says, no, procrastinator. Until I figured out it was hurting me. Dave, good for you for figuring that out. Some people aren't aware of it. Now, I'm going to tell you a story. So this was several years ago. I was at a publishing conference. I used to be in the publishing world. I was the CEO of Thomas Nelson Publishers. And I was at an author gathering at a trade show. 
And I saw this old friend that I hadn't seen for a long time, and I went up to him and I said, hey, how are you doing? And we kind of exchanged pleasantries, but then it went sour and south very quickly because he began to complain to me. I said, how's your, how's your writing career going? Because he's a full-time writer. And he started complaining about what an idiot his publisher was. You know, they just didn't support him. They didn't get him. They didn't fulfill all their marketing commitments. And I said, well, what about your agent? I mean, that's one of the reasons you have an agent is so that they can run interference with the publisher and be your advocate. And he said, oh, my, my agent's worthless. You know, he won't return my phone calls. So he just kept complaining. Now, look, I know sometimes people need to vent, okay? So I'm not talking about that. I need to vent from time to time. You need to vent from time to time. That's not what I'm talking about. What happened to him was the more I listened, the more he created drama, the worse it got. So it wasn't very long before I wanted to exit that conversation and I made an excuse to leave. He was toxic. And that pessimism was acting as a repellent. And it was repelling me and it was probably repelling a lot of other people and especially a lot of opportunities that otherwise would have come to him. Yeah, somebody says an energy, energy drain. These are like emotional vampires. You know, they just suck the energy out of you. Somebody else said toxic. What do you do with people like that, Jesse asked. Great question. What do you do with people that are toxic? I want to suggest a few things because somebody actually wrote in and said uh, to me, knowing that I was going to be talking to the, about this today on uh, this Periscope session, they said, what if you're handcuffed to that person? Now, I asked him a follow-up question. I didn't hear back from him. Maybe I just missed it in my Twitter stream because I had a lot of tw uh, retweets today. But what if you're married to that person? You know, it's not as simple as what I usually advise, which is, you know, find new friends. You know, if you've got a, a friend that's pessimistic, one of the most important things you can do is get new friends. I mean, I, I hate to say that. It sounds cruel. But you become like the people you hang around with. So if you're going to hang around with negative, pessimistic people, guess what happens? It's contagious. Do you hear me? It's contagious. When people are negative, you can catch it. On the, on the flip side of that, when people are positive, when they're energetic, when they're uh, looking forward to the future, that's also contagious, okay? But what happens when you're married to that negative person? Okay. I want to give you a few thoughts on that. I don't, I don't have the definitive word because honestly, I'm married to an extremely positive person. Gail's top strength on strength finders is positivity. I know, lucky me. Yeah, and I am lucky because um, she's very positive. Even when things go south or get negative, she stays positivity, positive. Somebody else says, yeah, that's me. Always uh, the sunshine. Yeah, that's cool. I'd love to hear that. Here's what I would do. If you're married to a negative person, I would do a couple of things. First thing I would do is make sure that I'm leading well. Now, here's what I mean by leading. I don't mean some kind of, you know, where you fit on the food chain, you know, whether you're the leader of your family or not. I, I, I see all of us as leaders in that we influence other people. We're constantly influencing people, positive or negative. If you agree with that, tap a couple times on your screen and give me some hearts. I'd love to see the heart count on this run way up. But if you agree with that, tap on the screen. You have influence, even if you're not the boss, you know, even if you're not the head of your home, even if you're a child in a home with negative parents. But I think, first of all, I would purpose in my heart that I'm going to be a positive person, that I'm going to do my best. It doesn't mean I, I can't have down days. It doesn't mean I can't, you know, from time to time be negative. But generally, my disposition is going to be positive. I'm going to be an optimist about the future, about my opportunities, all the rest, because that attracts opportunities to you. So that's where I would start. Second thing I would do is if somebody's complaining or being negative with me, particularly a spouse or a child or a coworker or maybe even your boss, I'd let them vent. You know, you might discover uh, that it's just a transient thing, that maybe they had a bad day. Maybe they're just tired. I mean, this happens to me a lot. I tend to be negative and pessimistic at night when I've had a long, hard day. And so sometimes it's not reflective of my objective circumstances. It's just reflective of the fact that I'm tired. Has that ever happened to you? My guess is that it does. So cut them some slack, give them some grace, 
Ask them some questions. Here's a key without judgment. Okay. Your job is not to fix them. You know, maybe you can help them see the light, but it comes by being an example first, second, showing empathy. And then you might start prying a little bit about their worldview. You have to be careful about this, but what is it that led to that kind of pessimism? You know, maybe they had a, a string of unfortunate experiences where they lost trust and they just couldn't believe in the future. Maybe you're part of the problem. You know, maybe you've made some promises that you haven't delivered on and they've gotten cynical about you. And you may need to revisit those and just be honest about them. For example, let's say that you try to start a business and it failed and now your spouse, maybe your husband or your wife is negative about you starting another business and you think, why do you have to be such a pessimist? Can't you be optimistic here? I'm trying to start a business. I need your support. But maybe it's because of that experience where they didn't deal with the past. And you might help have to help them to excavate that a little bit and just to say something like, honey, look, I know as you think about me going out on this venture, maybe it's a little bit scary because I did fail at that last opportunity. You know, it, it wasn't what either one of us hoped. But here's what I believe. My future does not equal my past. Do you believe that? Tap on the screen and give me some hearts. Your future does not equal your past. So just because you failed in the past does not mean you're going to fail in the future. Different circumstances, hopefully you've learned something, you've got a much better shot at it, but you might just have to talk this out. And it may be, and this is probably the fourth thing I would suggest, it may just take some time. It may be that they need to rebuild trust, rebuild belief, have some wins under their belt so that their confidence improves. Because I think pessimism oftentimes is a self-protective kind of behavior. You know, people want to be pessimistic because it's easier than getting your hopes up and having them dashed and the pain of that. So I, I would just do those, whether it was your wife or your boss or whatever. And let's just say it's your boss. Sometimes you have to go to sit, have a sit down with them and say, look, Here's what I think you want. Again, you always got to frame it in terms of what they want, not what you want. Here's what I think you want for our organization or for our department or for this ministry or for this organization. And I think there's something getting in the way that's keeping you from getting the results you want. And I wonder if you'd give me permission to share that with you. And then just share openly. My guess is that they'll receive it if it's given in the right kind of spirit. If they don't, you probably need to make plans to find another place to work. Because if they can't get optimistic, it's only a matter of time before you become cynical and pessimistic yourself, and I don't want that for you. So you may need to make plans to leave. Okay, questions. Give me two question marks in the comment bo box. Give me your name in all caps so I can recognize you, and then I'll take your questions one at a time. And if it says you can't ask any questions because the broadcast is too full, then X out and come back in. Sometimes that helps. Johnny Quinn says, any tips on how to handle someone who gets offended easily? Yeah, sometimes this feels like you're walking on eggshells, doesn't it? And I think sometimes you have to sit down and have that conversation. Um, I always ask permission first, you know, because once they give you permission, then they've given you permission, right? So I would always, again, frame it on how that's hurting them and not helping them get the results they want. So it can't be about you. It's got to be about them. And most people will receive it if they see it in that kind of um, framework. Sarah says, so true. If you approach from a loving place, people are more open. Look, I had to have a hard conversation yesterday with somebody. And I'm going to tell you, I actually, I prayed before the conversation that I could do what it talks about in the Bible. I think it's Ephesians 4.15 to speak the truth in love. Now, those two things are key. I want to speak the truth. I, I want to be courageous. I don't want to water it down. I don't want to back down. I don't want to be fearful to speak the truth because why? The truth shall set you free. So you got to speak the truth. But a lot of people do that in a way that's very hurtful. And so I want to be able to do it in love. So to stand for that person, for to, to stand for their greater self, to stand for our relationship and what it means to me. Joy says, are you coming out with a new book soon? Yes, the book's called Living Forward. It'll be out next March. I've gotten some tremendous endorsements, including Seth Godin and Tony Robbins and David Allen and a number of other ones. I'm gonna take one of these scope sessions and talk about it, but not today. 
The truth will cause chaos and such... Um, I'm not going to repeat that. We'll hit the fan. Sometimes, I think that's a very convenient excuse that will keep you stuck and keep the other people stuck. If you keep telling yourself that, you're not going to make any progress. You're not going to help the people around you. And it's just, it's a mindset issue. Karen says, what if your pessimism is based on fear of failure? Well, first of all, if that's the case, that's awesome that you've recognized it. You know, because you, it's like peeling the layers of, a, um, uh, of an onion off. You're now one step closer to the truth. And I would just ask the question, why are you afraid of failing? And then keep peeling that onion back and keep going back and back. And the best way, I mean, you can get very, um, you know, sort of uh, uh, reflective about this and, and keep going on it. I think the best way to overcome fear is to act. Matt says, tips to boost your mood when you're down. What I would say, Matt, is sometimes the most important thing you can do, and it's really easy, this is not going to cost you anything, get a good night's sleep. Because when you're rested, you have much more ability, many more resources to cope. When you're tired, you don't have those same resources. So that'd be one of the first things I would say. Get moving, somebody said. Madeline says that. Madeline's one of my daughters. Uh, yes, absolutely. Get moving. Your emotions will follow your movement. So I like to work standing up. I wish I could just wheel around here and show you my stand-up desk. But I stand up when I'm working. Why? Because I want to be in motion. You know, I sometimes walk around when I'm on phone calls, but get in motion. Um, what else? Eat healthy. Yes, absolutely. Okay, uh, Joanne says, do something positive for someone else on purpose. Absolutely. Kelly, positive music? Yes. I like to listen to a station called Focus at Will. And it's, check it out on the web, focusatwill.com. It's a great way to listen to positive, productive music that helps you be more focused. Emotions follow movements. Thank you. Lisa, from a leader's perspective, how do I teach motivation and fearlessness uh, to young team members? I'm going to tell you the most, the, the most powerful way to teach anything, anything, is to become, purpose in your heart, that you're going to become the living embodiment of what you want other people to be or to do. So for example, if you're a leader and you want people to be punctual to meetings, make sure that you're never late. If you want people to sit in meetings attentive and really listening, sit in a meeting attentive, really listening, and taking notes. Become, I think this was a Gandhi quote, become the change you want to see. So that's where I would start. And make sure that your energy is up. You know, I, I'm not saying you have to be rah-rah all the time, but people are going to track. They're going to connect with your energy. So you've got to make sure that you are up. And honestly, I think that's a caused thing. Clay says, do you remember what the acronym HALT stands for? I don't. I've heard that before, but I don't remember. Sorry, if you've got it, you can post it. Sarah Brown says, yes, embody what we want from others. Love, love, love. Be the example. Clay Patterson says, hungry, angry, lonely, tired. Yeah, that's going to uh, replicate itself, like it or not. Try to do something positive, Ethan says, that people don't expect in every meeting. Yeah, one of the things you can do is just recognize people. Tell them how much you appreciate them. Don't you feel energized when somebody appreciates you? Sometimes people are pessimistic and negative because they're trying to get attention because they don't feel significant. They don't feel like they're noticed. And when they can create the drama around them, then all the tension goes to them. So I just like to short circuit that by giving people the attention before they feel like they need it. Gratitude. A simple I see you can change a life. Sarah, that is so absolutely right. Madeline quoted this quote from Gandhi, be the change you wished you could see in the world. Yes, and smile. I've got a whole podcast on that. I've got a blog post on that. But smiling is huge. And I'm going to tell you, I'm not a natural smiler. I was at a um, monthly review meeting when I was at Thomas Nelson Publishers, and I was the CEO. All the divisional managers would appear before us once a month and give an account for what happened in the last month. And I had a consultant that was there with me. And, and during the first break, she called me aside. And she said, uh, can I ask you a question? I said, sure. And she said, are you pissed off? And I said, no. Why do you say that? And she said, well, you might want to let your face know it because you look like you're really angry. 
And it's hard for people to connect with you. It's hard for them to tell you the truth. It's hard for them to be a, a collaborator with you in problem solving when they feel like you're against them. So smile. And so I, it really set me on a course to work on my smiling. Somebody says, LOL. <laughs> it was funny. I just appreciated her guts in saying that. Nick says, so important in ministry. Oh my gosh, if I had a nickel for every angry minister I saw who has a scowl on his face when he's preaching, what is that? You know, that's completely unnecessary. Um, smile therapy. Stacy, ask your question again. It scrolled back before I, I saw it. It looked like a good one. Smiling doesn't work. Really? What evidence do you have for that? Look at my blog post on that at michaelhyatt.com because I give you some science behind what it does for you and what it does for others. Uh, as a vocal coach, I can tell you that the muscles involved in smiling lift not only your countenance, right, they lift your mood, right? They release endorphins in your bloodstream and it helps you to be more positive as well. As well. Ah, somebody said smiling does work. Okay, Stacy says, what about, uh, I think those that criticize your positivity? Gotta be honest. Do I really care? No, I don't care. You know, if somebody's gonna criticize my positivity, fine. You know, let the haters hate. There are gonna be people who criticize you for all kinds of things. Would you mind if people criticized you because you were too loving, or you were too kind, or you were too generous? I don't think so. I think I'd probably wear that as a badge of honor. So if people think I'm too positive, too bad. I'm sorry, I, I just don't have patience for that. Fonda says, uh, kill them with kindness. Yes, kill them with kindness. So I, I, I hope what you're taking out of this is that you have got to lead by being authentic, yes, but being a positive influence, okay? So somebody says, uh, loving today's message, Michael, be kind, hashtag be kind. Uh, I make myself smile at something if I feel bad mood looming. Uh, by the way, my friend um, Lucy Swindoll says, I, I love this. She says, you know, one of the secrets to me being a happy person is I take everything as a compliment. <laughs> Even criticism, I take everything as a compliment. What if that criticism for being too positive, you just consider it a, a compliment? I think that's awesome. Yeah, it does change your, your mood. Any other questions? We've got about two minutes left. And I want to make sure speaking the truth and being positive doesn't guarantee we get it back, but still do it. Meg, thank you. That's exactly right. We've got to do the right thing, even when it doesn't give us uh, the results that we want. I mean, if you have a conversation with somebody, you've spoken the truth in love and they still resist or they're, they're negative or they explode or whatever, all you can do is take responsibility for your response. That's what responsibility means that I have the ability to respond and to own my response. I can't own anybody else's response, right? Okay, guys, we're out of time. Thank you so very much for visiting today. I hope this has been helpful to you. Pessimism will absolutely destroy, sabotage your future. So don't let it happen to you. Be positive, smile today, make a difference in the lives of the people around you. You've got agency use it. And we'll see you tomorrow. Thanks.